Hello, Roger Bisbee here from the Skill Builder channel. And today in my little rant, I want to talk about air tightness. And not just air tightness, but air tightness in buildings. Why do we need air tightness? Why do some people think that buildings ought to be airtight? Sounds like a bad idea, doesn't it? You know, submarine, great, airtight. Spaceship, airtight. A house, airtight. Why do we need that? Energy, conservation, save fuel, save money. Because when that air is blowing into a house and that air is blowing out of a house, it's carrying with it your valuable heat. We don't want to be wasting heat because it makes higher fuel bills. And also, it's bad for the planet. We all know that. So everything we can do to save the planet and lower our fuel bills got to be a good thing, right? But you may already have noticed the flaw in this argument, and that is that we need air to breathe. So that means we need ventilation. The phrase is airtight to ventilate right. If you look at various things like the building regulations, they tell you you've got to put trickle vents in the top of the windows, which is a great idea, isn't it? Put those little trickle vents in the top of your doors, your windows, wherever else. Get enough ventilation into the room and everything else is okay. But is it? Those trickle vents, a lot of them have a little slide open and close. And if it's the winter and there's a cold draft blowing in there, you're going to close it. And then maybe you're going to forget to open it. So already we've got a little bit of a problem, but it doesn't stop there. We are breathing out carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Generally, carbon dioxide is not a brilliant thing to be breathing in all day long. So what kind of ailments do you suffer when you breathe in too much carbon dioxide? Dizziness, headaches, tingling in your fingers. Pins and needles, difficulty breathing, sweating, tiredness, increased heart rate, high blood pressure. In the end, coma, you go to sleep and you die. We all die sometime or another. Get over it. Carbon dioxide, too much of it is a very bad thing. So we have trickle ventilation. We measure the size of a room and we work out how much ventilation we need to put in there to keep the carbon dioxide levels down. Does that work? Yeah, kind of works. But of course, we don't know how many people are in a room. If we've got a small room, we put in a small ventilator. If we've got a large room, we put in a larger ventilator. We work all this out on the cubic capacity of the room. Trouble is, it doesn't work that way. The smaller the room, the more concentrated the air. So if you've got four people in a small room, you actually need more ventilation than if you've got four people in a large room or even eight people in a very large room because obviously the dilution levels, you've got air in the, in the room and it's been the carbon dioxide Oxide that you're breathing out has been diluted so it figures that you've got a small room crowded room you tend to need more ventilation so they got that bit wrong and of course all those figures for those trickle ventilators presuppose that we're keeping them open which i've already said we don't but even if we do keep them open what do we do at night we draw the curtains created a barrier it's not an airtight barrier but it's certainly going to cut down on the ventilation the other thing is if you put a trickle ventilator in a window on one side of the room that air blows in what's it going to do if it hasn't got another one on the other side of the room you're not actually getting a flow of air across and you may find you're getting a little bit of localized air but it's not actually ventilating the room might be causing a little draft there but it's not changing the air it's not getting rid of that carbon dioxide so maybe you're beginning to get the idea that i'm not a total fan of air tightness i see the benefits of it I see the conservation elements of it, but in terms of just closing up our homes, trapping that carbon dioxide in there and all the other nasties, then I think it's something that needs a little bit of thinking about. Who's doing the thinking? It needs some research in proper buildings, not just models. Models are notoriously unreliable. All kinds of things change when you put people into the situation. Then you put furniture into the house. Everything changes. The cubic capacity of those rooms is cut down as soon as you put a sofa in there and a few other things in there. Even a bedroom, when you put a bed in there, that takes up some of the airspace, doesn't it? So what it's doing basically is concentrating all those bad things that you don't want like the carbon dioxide and the pollutants into a smaller area so those other things that i mentioned what are they well they're the contaminants that we get they're things like if we've cut down on the ventilation and we've raised the heat we're going to raise the humidity because we're breathing out not only carbon dioxide but water vapor we're having showers we're 
cooking, we're doing all kinds of things which create litres and litres of water which is drifting around the house. We need to get rid of that. If we don't get rid of that, the humidity levels rise and that plays right into the hands of our old friend the dust mite. They love it warm, they love it fuggy. Now my parents, when they got older, they moved into a purpose-built bungalow. When I went round there, lovely double glazing, central heating, and they loved it. Open the door, it was like the tropics. The humidity levels in that bungalow were so high they were off the scale. And I used to go, they go, blimey, how can you live in here? How can you breathe? Of course, they got used to it. They didn't know they're sitting there all day. You get acclimatized, you get used to high humidity. But with that comes all the other problems. Asthma, dust mite, pollutants. They've got new carpets in there. They've got new buildings building materials. Back in the early 1900s, the number of materials going into a house, in other words, bricks, cement, plaster, timber, were around about 50 materials to build a house. Sounds quite reasonable, doesn't it? What do you think it is now? And this figure has to allow for the fact it's not only the house, but the things we're putting into the house. It goes from 50 in the 1900s to an estimated 55. No, 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 no. 55,000. There are 55,000 different products that go into a house now. They're looking at computers, they're looking at carpets, they're looking at everything. But a large majority of those things are synthetic. And quite honestly, even though we think we know, we don't really know. I mean, as Donald Rumsfeld said, there are known knowns and there are known unknowns. You get the idea. We don't actually know what this stuff is doing to us. Even air fresheners. You think an air freshener is a good thing. Actually, stuff in there that really you'd be better off not breathing. Cleaning materials, all kinds of things are what they call off-gassing, giving off gas. And then surprise, surprise, we find that our kids have got asthma. Everybody knows a child with asthma, but everybody knows an old person with breathing difficulties. And when I was a plumber, I used to go out and see some of these little old ladies as well and they'd be sitting there there's a one I remember and she sat there freezing cold house one fire in one room and she just didn't even have hot water she just had a cold tap in the back there nothing had changed since her husband went off and was killed in the first world war she had just sat there it was a rented house and she wasn't asking for it to be upgraded and they weren't going to offer. So there she sat in this, what we would consider to be primitive conditions, but the old lady lived till 98. And you may think I'm exaggerating, but the figures bear it out. We are suffering more from these breathing difficulties and this ill health and all these allergies that we knew nothing about years ago. And of course, if you do suffer from asthma or you do suffer from an allergy, they may give you a little skin prick test. They may try certain things out on you, find out what it is that's bugging you. But of course they don't go to your home. And some years ago I went to a house and I was doing some work, had the floorboards lifted up. And when I had the floorboards lifted up, I noticed that the boiler flue was actually disconnected under the floorboard. I alerted the customers to this and I said, oh, this really needs fixing. They said to me, do you know what? Our kids have been suffering from dizziness, headaches, running eyes, and we've been to the doctor several times for them, and we found it was worse in the winter, and we moved them out of that room because we thought there was something that they were allergic to in that room, and they got better. Could have killed them, it didn't, thankfully, but it did produce a lot of health problems for those kids through some of their formative years. And who knows what the knock-on effect of that is. So that's just one side of the air tightness argument, but let's look at something else on air tightness. Now, years ago, that house would have had one of the greatest passive ventilation systems known to man, chimneys. Probably a fireplace in every room. What we had there is we had air coming into the house, leaking in through gaps around the windows, under the floorboards. Real cold, drafty house. We had fires roaring away all day and the number of air changes in that room when you've got a fire going could be as much as one complete air change of the room every six minutes. It's that high. And obviously with that goes a lot of heat, which is not a great idea. You get the heat coming out from the coal fire, the radiated heat, but you're actually losing loads and loads of heat up the chimney all the time. So if you stood on top of that roof like Father Christmas, you would soon learn that a lot of that heat, maybe 80% of the household heat, is going straight up the chimney. Not a great idea. 
Let's do away with those nasty old chimneys. Let's put in some nice central heating. Lovely little boiler. Room seal boiler, no problem. No ventilation coming in for the boiler. It gets its ventilation from outside. Doesn't need all these gaps. So we seal all the gaps up. Put insulation everywhere. We put draft proofing everywhere. When we do that, the moisture levels rise in the house. That moisture that we're creating has nowhere to escape. So where does it escape? Well, it escapes out through the fabric of the building. Because when you heat air up, it contains more moisture, the pressure rises and it forces its way out through the fabric of the building. The heat is running to cold, the, the air is escaping, and so we've got a temperature differential, we've got a density differential here, and the water vapor, remember we're talking about vapor, we're talking about steam, we're talking about very, very tiny molecules, we're not talking about droplets. The water vapor is going out through the walls. Now, if we've got insulation in the walls, that's fine. And when it gets to the cold side of insulation, it starts to condense. So if that's a cavity wall, for example, that moisture would hit the outside wall, the outside skin, and it would just trickle down and it would evaporate out of there, which is one reason why you want to be very careful about rendering those walls and putting in a waterproofer. You see plasterers doing this all the time. They render the wall, they put in waterproofer on the wall. Obviously, they're keeping the rain out, but they're also locking the moisture in. So that whole wall becomes wet. And when that whole wall becomes wet, becomes damp, it loses some of its insulation value because wet insulation is no insulation at all. So similarly, in a timber frame house, okay, we've got timber here rather than brickwork and we've got insulation between the timber and then we've got maybe we've got brick cladding or something else on the outside. As our moisture goes through the timber frame, if it can't escape on the outer skin fast enough, it starts to rot the timber frame. So in that case, it's very, very essential that we put in a good vapor barrier all the way around the house. And when I say all the way around the house, it needs to be sealed absolutely everywhere. So that vapor barrier needs to be integrated, all the joins, even something where you've put a cable through the wall or a pipe through the wall or a socket where you've cut the vapor barrier, all needs to be carefully taped up because the amount of moisture that can escape through one small hole in that vapor barrier is huge. And of course, once it's in that wall, it's going to start rotting. We want to keep the moisture in the house rather than letting it migrate through the walls. Oh, fantastic. That's the other part of air tightness. That's the other reason why they want houses to be airtight. Not only to conserve fuel, but also to protect the fabric of the building. So we don't find moisture escaping through the building up into the loft, other places like that and sitting there rotting away, producing mold, producing all kinds of things that we don't want. We make it airtight and then we need to get rid of all that moisture. Not only do we need to ventilate the house to keep us breathing and healthy, we also need to ventilate the house to get rid of the moisture. So it becomes even more important that we put in extractor fans. So we've got a bathroom there, we put an extractor fan in there, put an extractor fan in the kitchen, we put in some kind of whole house ventilation system, heat recovery, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery system. If we're gonna fold it so that we're bringing in fresh air, we're blowing fresh air in there, we're taking out stale air. The whole thing is carefully balanced. But of course that only happens in houses where they can afford it. It isn't actually a requirement of the building regulations when you make an airtight building to put in a mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. You can actually just have the trickle ventilators or whatever, and you can do it passively like that. This system, if you're gonna build an airtight house, you really have to think about putting in some kind of whole house ventilation system, MVHR. Mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, bit of a mouthful, but that's the way to go. Of course, you can get another system which just sucks in a bit of air from around the loft and it just blows air into the house, pressurizes the house very, very slightly. It pushes out the air and the moisture, obviously, the airborne moisture, 
through all the little gaps around the building. But I've just said we're going to seal those gaps up. So if you're using one of these systems where you're just simply pressurizing the house and you've sealed up all your gaps, it's obvious that that thing is not going to work so well. And where is that airborne moisture being pushed to? If it's being pushed out into the cavities, if it's being pushed out into the fabric of the building where we don't want it pushed out, then that is a problem. In many cases, you're better off putting the house under some kind of negative pressure than you are putting it under a positive pressure. So when people have got a condensation problem, which a condensation is obviously caused by high humidity in there looking for cold spots to condense on, and that can be cold bridging, they may go for this system thinking, oh, that solves the condensation problem, and it will. But what they don't know is what it's doing to the fabric of the house, where that moisture is going. It's always a good question to ask. Where is that moisture going? So if it's going out through those little trickle ventilators and all those other places, then that's fantastic. Again, we come back to tenanted properties. We come back to people who haven't got an awful lot of money. And I'm sorry to bang on about this like that, but it always seems to be, it's the same the whole world over. Ain't it all a bloody shame? It's the rich what gets the favours and the poor what gets the blame. Ah, you know that one. So, you know it's the poor that suffer. The poor that suffer on all these experiments, all these things, and it will continue to be the case. You've got a, a house which is occupied by a larger than usual number of people, maybe a large family, maybe limited income, difficulty drying their washing. My mum had six kids and she used to dry our washing all over the house just to get us to school on a Monday morning. It was a constant struggle in the winter when she couldn't hang that washing outside. So I know the problem, it does build up un acceptable levels of moisture in a house and of course with that comes the condensation and with that comes all that ugly black mold which can cause real problems for people's health. So not only does it happen to children, it happens to all ages. We're all suffering from having that black mold in our house. Get rid of it, it's toxic, nasty stuff. So a lot of the time if it's tenanted properties and they've got mould coming round and they've just run a whole series on ITV news showing all these places, Croydon Council and all the rest of it. Isn't this disgusting? Look at these places these people are living in. They're covered in black mould and they are absolutely horrendous. But of course, they, they talk about the council, they talk about the landlord, the landlord's got to fix this. It's a disgrace in this day and age that anybody should be living under these conditions. But of course, it's not easily fixable because you go into a house, you see where the problem is. You say to the tenants, don't dry your washing on the radiators, open a few windows. And they say, I can't do that. I've got to dry my washing. Where am I going to dry my washing? The pokey little flat. So air tightness is a great idea. The only trouble is it could be killing us. Save the planet, kill the people. How's that for a catchphrase? I'm Roger Bisby. Come back and see me for another rant. I'm not running out of subjects. Well, not yet anyway. <laughs> Let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at it. See what we got. See what we got. See what we got.